This is Glenn Robinson, President of the World Affairs Council of the Monterey Bay Area. I would like to welcome you to our newest edition of Quick Takes on International Affairs. Please enjoy this talk and do consider joining the World Affairs Council. Hello, uh, I'm Boyd Haight of the World Affairs Council of Monterey Bay. I would like to welcome Peter Martin, a political reporter for Bloomberg News, who has written extensively on escalating tensions in the US-China relationship. Hi, thanks. thanks so much for having me. Okay, great. Our conversation will focus on China's wolf warrior diplomacy, drawing on Peter's recent book, China's Civilian Army, The Making of Wolf Warrior Diplomacy, which traces the roots of China's approach to diplomacy back to the communist revolution of 1949. He tells the story of how it has evolved through the social upheaval, famine, capitalist reforms, and China's rise to superpower status. Let's start with a mundane question to set the scene, Peter. What are the main elements and purposes of diplomacy? Yeah, so, so I, 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 the best definition that I've found is that it's a, it's a kind of performative art of persuasion. You know, it's like, it's the ability to, um, to take your preferences, your country's preferences and persuade others that they should adopt them and that it would be in their best interests to adopt them. And I think when that's, when that's done really well, um, it involves diplomats thinking about, you know, everything they've learned over decades about the, the history and the culture of the place that they're, that they're working and taking the temperature of the room and massaging their country's messaging in a way that, that makes it appeal to others. And, you know, it's, it's, it was once referred to as uh, the art of having someone else, uh, the art of someone else having your way, uh, which, which I think is, uh, is, a, is a nice, neat summary of it. And, and you know, when, when you think about the way that the world we live in is, is changing, uh, we have this, we're moving from a world after the end of the Cold War where the United States was unquestionably dominant and, and the whole world kind of revolved around responses to US power to a world where there are lots of different centers of leadership. And I think in that world, the ability to persuade is, is going to be increasingly important. And, and the question of whether the US is able to do it, whether China is able to do it, and, and others can participate too, is going to be really crucial. Great. Okay. Well, at the outset in your book, you state that taken together with economic, technological, and ideological prowess, diplomacy is a key part of what makes any power great. Now, in this context, how has China's approach to and the practice of diplomacy broadly changed over time? Yeah, so, you know, when China um, started to put together a, a diplomatic corps in, in 1949, this, this new communist government had, had kind of come to power after decades of, of civil war, and it found itself really quite isolated um, in the world. And, um, you know, it faced uh, a, a increasingly anti-communist United States. There was a rival government on the island of Taiwan, which claimed to be the legitimate um, government of China. Um, and of course, the, the Cold War. And um, in, that, in that context, this new regime needed to find a way to communicate with the outside world and build bridges. And, you know, it, it, it had almost no diplomatic ties at all outside of the Soviet bloc. Um, but at the same time, it needed to um, make sure that those interactions didn't undermine its kind of fragile hold over this new country and was intensely paranoid about efforts from the, the capitalist West to, to do that. And so um, their approach, the, the approach of China's first foreign minister, Zhou Enlai, was to, was to model China's diplomatic corps on the People's Liberation Army. So he said that Chinese diplomats should think and act like the People's Liberation Army in civilian clothing. And what he meant by that was that just like the Chinese military, Chinese diplomats would have to be unfailingly loyal to, um, to the Communist Party, always follow orders, maintain incredible, almost militaristic discipline, um, and you know, and also display what he called a fighting spirit when China's interests were challenged. And so right from the outset, that's a, that's a kind of 
theme that has flowed consistently through the way that that China has conducted its foreign affairs. Um, and, and, and kind of within that, there has been this ebb and flow of sometimes that discipline being applied to um, a push to charm the world and win friends for China, like it did in the 1950s and again in the 1990s. And sometimes, especially when there's been political tension at home and purges and a cult of personality around particular leaders, sometimes that has led to um, you know, a kind of diplomacy which is very abrasive, often quite ideological, and, and which we would now call wolf warrior diplomacy. Okay, you mentioned Zhou Enlai. Um, how have key personalities in uh, the Chinese government and the Communist Party played a role in the evolutions of uh, China's diplomacy? Yeah, I mean, I, I kind of think of Zhou as the founding father of Chinese diplomacy. He he plays a role in the Chinese foreign ministry, which is, is kind of similar to the role that J. Edgar Hoover played in the FBI. You know, just this, this extraordinarily charismatic personality who took a bureaucratic institution and kind of molded it in his own image. And, um, you know, so, so that, that kind of was felt through, uh, you know, Joe had this in incredibly deferential relationship to Mao Zedong, um, you know, the, the, the kind of supreme leader in China and uh, always made sure that, that diplomacy was seen as a tool that served the top leadership rather than a kind of power center of its own. Um, and, you know, that was, that was true when Joe was in charge and it's true now. And I think that's, that's quite consistent. Also, this incredible focus on small details and uh, attention to detail, which, um, you know, in, in some ways helps the foreign ministry to uh, be, you know, professional and, and, and make sure things run smoothly, but can also come across to the outside world as incredibly petty, especially when it's applied to kind of looking for slights and how, how was our leader spoken to and was he... Did, did people shake hands with him in the right way and look at him in the right way and, and that kind of thing. So, so I would say that that, that kind of fastidiousness has also kind of uh, been handed on over the years and, and Joe was really central to laying that down. Okay, great. So you sort of covered the first 30 to 40 years of uh, Chinese diplomacy setting the, the foundation and the, the approach. And, and then you wrote that um, the world of the 1990s, that is after Tiananmen Square, after the fall of the Soviet Union uh, appeared profoundly threatening to Chinese leaders. So how did they use diplomacy to meet this challenge? Yeah, you know, the, the period after Tiananmen um, was extraordinarily challenging for, for Chinese diplomats. You know, the, the country had spent the 1980s um, kind of, in, or the you know, embracing economic reforms, um, building up a close relationship with um, the United States. They were even, uh, you know, cooperating in, in Afghanistan in the, in the 1980s. It was a, an, an, you know, an amazing turnaround from, from that kind of pariah state status that, that China had had earlier on in the Cold War. Uh, and, and of course, the, the Tiananmen massacre kind of brought that all crashing down and established China once again as a, as a pariah. And, and there was this incredible fight back that was launched by the Chinese state um, after it had kind of gotten its ducks in a row and, and felt secure in its, its leadership of the country again. They launched this very concerted um, charm offensive to win over world opinion. And so the way that they did that was focusing very uh, narrowly on <clears throat> a set of sort of central priorities. They wanted sanctions removed against the, the, the ruling communist party. Um, and they wanted an international environment which would allow China's economy to continue to grow. Um, so, so they followed this strategy, um, which, which they, they, they kind of called hide your capabilities and bide your time. So that meant setting aside territorial disputes with other countries, focusing on economic reforms at home, um, reassuring other countries that China didn't have the intention, for example, of, you know, in Southeast Asia, using overseas Chinese communities to infiltrate their political systems, which had always been a, a worry, um, and, and finding issues where they could work with other governments. So 
Of course, in the end of the Cold War, fears about the proliferation of nuclear technology were a massive issue and, and China was able to develop expertise in that area and, and use it as a way to build trust with the United States. And so kind of all of those things, and, and of course, individual Chinese diplomats were also tremendously effective at, at putting that message across. And all of those things kind of combined um, to create this, this, this runway for China's international reputation, which really led up to the 2008 Summer Olympic Games, which were seen around the world as, as kind of this um, affirmation that China had arrived and perhaps that China was being um, accepted into the, the global community of nations um, as something akin to a regular country, you know, the, the kind of place that, that um, the outside could, could work with, the United States could have strong ties with, and, and, you know, its political system and its economic system were very different to um, those used in the West, but, but maybe um, there was a way of working together and living together. And of course, um, things have changed since then, but, but that, that nearly two decades of runway, I think, owed a lot to that uh, in, in incredibly successful approach to diplomacy they pursued in the 90s. Great, okay. So in fact, you mentioned the change and China and the world have uh, changed significantly in the first uh, decades of this century since uh, 2000, 2001. <clears throat> So how has China used uh, diplomacy to expand its reach uh, in the world uh, in the last 20 years? How has it evolved from the hide and buy approach that you mentioned? Yeah, I, you know, I think we've seen this just incredible um, expansion of, of Chinese ambition on the world stage. And, and I, I think that the, you know, so if that, if that period of like charm offensive finished around 2008, this new period of, of assertiveness and confidence and um, sometimes even aggression started um, in, in, in the wake of the 2008-9 global financial crisis. So uh, Chinese leaders had long felt that um, they, they needed to be quite differential toward the economic expertise of the West and learn from it and um, that their, their model was kind of a work in progress and and um, as they watched the, the West really have a very kind of slow and indecisive response to that crisis, they started to look at their own system where they launched, of course, this massive economic stimulus package, um, which, which created problems for the Chinese economy down the road, but at the time was widely hailed as, you know, kind of helping to save the world economy. Um, and, and they started to think, you know what, maybe maybe there's something to our system and maybe we don't need to take lessons from the outside anymore. Um, and, you know, of course they just hosted the Olympics. And so there was this kind of new confidence there on the part of China, but there was also this um, uh, ever present vigilance, right? We, I talked about how um, in the early days, China was worried about outside threats to um, it's, it's a, the Communist Party's ability to rule. And, you know, in, in 2011, they watched the Arab Spring break out across the Middle East and they thought, you know what, the, these forces that have threatened autocratic governments are still alive and well, and we need to be really vigilant. So there was this kind of, um, and, and that led to these, these uh, assertive displays, you know, Chinese diplomats getting very angry in public with people and China really pushing on its territorial claims in the East China Sea against Japan and in the South China Sea and, and starting to um, step up and, and take what it believed was, was owed to it. Those, those forces were already in play when Xi Jinping became China's top leader in 2012. And he took that assertive turn in Chinese foreign policy and he made it more consistent um, and, and, and more ambitious and, and wide ranging. And of course, we've seen him launch the, the Belt and Road Infrastructure Initiative, um, spending billions of dollars overseas um, to connect economies across Central Asia and, and much of the rest of the world. And we've seen him build China's first overseas uh, military base in Djibouti, um, militarizing artificial islands that China has built in the, the South China Sea. Um, speaking at Davos and the United Nations and, 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 and talking publicly about how China has a model that the other countries might want to, to learn from and to follow. And so, um, you know, we really what we've seen is just this, this sweeping ambition from China 
um, and, and on the part of Chinese diplomats um, are really much, uh, much more strident, assertive and combative approach, um, which, which outsiders have, 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 of course, dubbed wolf warrior diplomacy in recent years. Right. So now th there is a, a view that uh, China is entering into an economic slowdown. I mean, it's clearly there's still growth, but not growth at the same rate as in the past and a significant amount of external uh, resistance building up to its, its approach. Um, how do you think China is going to react to that uh, going forward? So, so in the past, um, you know, China watches kind of comment on how there have been these periods of overreach and then recalibration. So if you think about the period um, during the Cultural Revolution, when China was incredibly isolated, that there was this uh, just astonishing turnaround inviting Henry Kissinger and Richard Nixon to Beijing and starting this process of, of engaging America and engaging the West um, and improving China's position in the world. And, and we just talked at length about how China kind of did the same thing after the Tiananmen crackdown. There was this turnaround moment, which was very successful. And since 2008-9, uh, as China's behavior has become more and more assertive, of course, there's been this growing backlash against Chinese power, um, which really reached a crescendo during the coronavirus outbreak, when other countries were very angry about China's handling of the, the pandemic. Um, and, 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 and felt like um, the way that China was behaving internationally um, kind of set off warning signals about its future um, in the world. And, and as that backlash has grown, and we can see it in you know, Pew polling, which shows that uh, across the West, uh, perceptions of China, negative perceptions of China are at record highs. You can see it in the way that NATO and the, the Quad nations, Australia, Japan, and India are working with the US, the Five Eyes Intelligence Allowance, uh, the Alliance, all of these institutions have started to work with the United States and against China. And uh, those of us who have spent a long time watching Chinese foreign policy kind of been waiting for this moment where the leadership in Beijing will start to recalibrate again and start to um, attempt to turn around that backlash. And, and what's been really striking is just how long that's taken and how we're still waiting for that to happen. And I, I, I think that, um, you know, in many ways, um, Xi Jinping and the top Communist Party leaders maybe feel now like China has reached a stage where it's powerful enough and it's in a position that it doesn't need to moderate its policies for the West because China's economy is large enough, China's military is strong enough to, um, to assert its claims, and the rest of the world is just going to have to learn to deal with it. And they look at, you know, political gridlock in Washington. Um, they look at sluggish growth rates in Europe. Um, they look at, uh, you know, the clashes with police on the streets of the US over the Black Lives Matter movement, all of, all of these things, um, which we've seen pop up in recent years, and they kind of think, you know what, your system doesn't look great, and our system looks pretty good. And we, we can argue about whether they're right or wrong about that, but that's how they feel. And I think that has, um, has allowed them to kind of continue on this path where they're acting very assertively. Much of the world doesn't like it. And, and frankly, they don't seem to care. Okay, well, so we have a uh, sort of a open-ended uh, situation going forward. I wanted to turn a bit to the practice of diplomacy again. How does China's current approach to diplomacy, you mentioned the Wolf Warrior uh, name, compare to the practices of the United States uh, in the diplomatic field? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, Chinese diplomats um, for a long, long time saw U.S. diplomacy as uh, a model that they needed to learn from. Um, and this was especially true after China started kind of capitalist reforms um, in the late 70s. So, 
you know, I've spoken to former US diplomats who, who were on the China desk at the State Department and Chinese diplomats would kind of come in and they would say, you know, can you tell us like, how does your social security system work? And if, if a country was interested, hypothetically speaking, in setting one up, like what would that look like? And, you know, so from the details of how US public policy worked through to the way that the US organizes its foreign service, there's been this, this um, great respect and, and desire to learn from the, the US. Um, uh, so that's that's kind of one piece. And that's, you know, naturally enough that has has kind of reduced over time, but it's, it's, it's still there. Um, and there was a set of reforms a few years ago in the foreign ministry, which gave um, Chinese ambassadors much greater control over the embassies that they led. And that, um, that reform was modeled on how US embassies are structured and how everyone uh, in the embassy, whether they're from the State Department or commerce or agriculture or whatever, needs to be accountable to the ambassador. Um, so that, that process of learning is, is, uh, is still continuing. Um, I'd say one of the big differences is that um, Chinese diplomats are far more specialized than their American counterparts. US diplomats um, are by design generalists and um, you know, some of them develop great expertise in countries like China and India and other nations across the world, but generally they spend their careers moving between different countries and different mm -hmm. regions and, and different issue sets. And that gives them this very impressive kind of broad focus, but it means that they don't develop um, the kind of very focused expertise that Chinese diplomats have, where typically they'll spend their whole career um, moving back and forth between Beijing and one or two other countries. So there's this very impressive cadre of um, America hands in the foreign ministry who have spent years being posted in Houston, San Francisco, Washington, New York, back to Beijing and, and kind of learning the US in that way and, and really making a study of America as a, as a country. And, and I think uh, sometimes the State Department hasn't been quite as good at doing that when it comes to China and other countries. And mm. I guess the, the, the last thing I would mention, um, and it's, it's, it's really crucial, is that um, while all governments expect uh, their diplomats to stay on message and to, um, you know, pursue the objectives that their, their, their national capital has set for them. Um, Washington allows US diplomats much greater freedom to, to take those messages and, and massage them and um, work them in, in ways that are going to be appealing to the person sitting across the table. Um, and uh, at their best, US diplomats are really extraordinarily effective um, when it comes to, to doing that. Chinese diplomats aren't. And that's not because of any, any lack of talent um, or, or education or skills. It's because China's political system provides them with really nearly, nearly no space to, um, to change the messages. And so you can sit down in, with Chinese diplomats in Fiji or Venezuela or Washington or wherever, and you are going to get an identical set of talking points on Taiwan, Tibet, Xinjiang, and all the other things that they care about. And um, it doesn't matter how you respond, doesn't matter how the conversation flows or what your personal chemistry is like, you're going to get those talking points delivered to you as Beijing wants them delivered with zero deviation. And, and that really does limit the ability of, of Chinese diplomats, you know, going, going back to your first question about how, how diplomacy is the art of persuasion, how can you be just persuasive if you have uh, kind of no, no space to improvise or to, to adjust your approach? And so that's another really big difference. And I, I think it's, a, it's an area where the US really does have an edge over China. Right, okay, so one, one final question then. How, how do you see China's diplomacy or approach to diplomacy evolving in the future? Sort of what's next for them? You, you described very well. How they, how they do diplomacy now, the, the social and economic uh, political situation. So looking, looking far ahead, your own experience and observation, where do you see them? How do you see them changing, if at all? Yeah, I mean, in the, in the sort of short to medium term, it's hard to see um, 
the, the moving away from this kind of strident wolf warrior approach that we've seen in recent years. Um, Xi Jinping, China's president, has talked about how it's important for China to cultivate a, a, a lovable and respected image in the world. And so he, he clearly does understand that there has been a backlash against China and there is some desire to kind of remedy that. I think the problem is that um, everything we've seen so far from, from President Xi and from the rest of the leadership suggests that they don't see the solution to that problem as um, being rooted in, in China's policies. They, they want to just do a better job of telling China's story and to improve kind of the, the window dressing of, of, of the way that China's behaving. But if you look at the depth of the backlash against China in, in Washington and across Western capitals and, and even in much of the developing world, the, the backlash is rooted in a, a, a very deep-seated and fundamental response to the way that China um, China's political system has evolved and China's foreign policy has evolved. So Western multinationals, Fortune 500 companies are deeply worried about the way that um, China's economic policies are run and the, the way that they use state-led industrial policy to pursue growth. Mm -hmm. Human rights groups, uh, members of Congress are really concerned about the human rights crackdown uh, in, in, in Xinjiang and, and the way that China is controlling Tibet and Hong Kong and other places. Um, the people in the Pentagon are worried about China's militarization of the South China Sea um, and uh, it's, it's kind of sweeping approach to territorial claims. And the list, got, you know, and, and, and many people are worried about Xi Jinping's abolition of term limits and the, the fact that he's apparently now leader for life. And all of these things kind of add up to a very, very deep seated backlash against China, which is rooted in the way that President Xi is ruling the country. And unless those policies change, it's really, really hard to imagine how um, China's image can improve. But until, until we see some sign from Xi that he plans to change things, I don't see its image improving either. Um, and so that's, you know, we're kind of at an impasse and, mm -hmm. uh, I, I, you know, that's, that's kind of where we find ourselves now. I, I guess just kind of one word of warning there is that, that China has been capable in the past of these extraordinary turnarounds. You know, who would have predicted in 1970 that in the next couple of years, uh, China would go from, you know, sworn enemy of America to partner in the Cold War. And who would have predicted after Tiananmen that China would go from pariah state to, um, you know, the successful host of the Olympics and, uh, and, and all of the positivity that led up to 2008. So while I don't see any signs of, of change on the near term horizon, we should always uh, keep our eyes open for any any. And, 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 and keep our minds open to the fact that, that sometimes there are rethinks going on um, in Beijing that are not visible to us, uh, just looking at signs on the surface. Okay, great. Well, that means challenges ahead. And I think that's a good point to bring our conversation to a close, Peter. I'd really like to thank you for taking the time uh, to talk to the World Affairs Council of Monterey Bay in this quick take uh, about China and China's diplomacy, uh, and uh, we wish you all the best in your in your work. Thanks so much. It was uh, it was really a pleasure talking to you. Great. Okay. Thanks.